Welcome to my video series on complex analysis. The purpose of this video is to reintroduce you to complex numbers, the complex plane, and some elementary operations on complex numbers that you've already encountered in your high school course. Starting off with the notion of what exactly is a complex number, well, the set of complex numbers denoted by this symbol C, any number Z belonging to this set can be represented as Z being equal to X plus I times Y where x and y are both real numbers. Now, x is what we call the real part of the complex number z, and y is called the imaginary part of z. And the number i is what we call the imaginary unit. And you have been introduced to this imaginary unit in your high school course as a solution to a certain equation. That equation was x squared plus 1 equal to 0. And we solved it by saying that x equaled plus or minus root negative 1. And we set this root negative 1 equal to the imaginary unit i. And this is a cool way of thinking about it, but a much nicer approach would be to think of the number i as an operator. And how exactly do we treat this as an operator? Well, we need to link complex numbers with vectors first. The set of complex numbers can be visualized as something called the complex plane. And that's because complex numbers need two real numbers to define them. So that means we need a set of perpendicular axes, one representing the real part of the complex numbers and the other representing the imaginary part. Okay, cool. And the origin is what we call the complex number zero plus zero times i. So that means if I have some arbitrary complex number z equal to x plus i times y, that means I have to walk x units on the real axis and i times y units on the imaginary axis. So that means I'll be located at this point, and this point with coordinates x, y is your complex number z. So we see clearly that there is a one-to-one -one correspondence between the complex plane, and the set R2. And that is cool in itself, but here's the other approach I was talking about. Treating the origin as the initial point for some vector, and the terminal point of this vector being this point x, y, we can represent every z belonging to c as a vector in the complex plane. And this vector mode of thinking of complex numbers is actually pretty cool because it gives us a nice intuitive perspective for various properties. Starting off with the modulus. Now the modulus of any complex number z equal to x plus i times y is the length of this vector. So that means z modulus would be defined as the square root of x squared plus y squared. But where's the justification for me saying that i is some kind of operator? And if it really is an operator, then what exactly does it do? Well, to visualize that, pick any real number a. And by real number, I just mean some marking here on the real axis. So if I multiply this real number by the imaginary unit i, what I get is a number completely on the imaginary axis, something we call a pure imaginary number. So after multiplica multiplication, what I have to do is walk i times a units on the vertical axis. So if I draw out the vectors representing the real number a and this purely imaginary number i times a that we got by multiplying i with a, it looks like multiplication with i rotated this vector 90 degrees anti-clockwise. Okay, cool. So that's one application of the operator i. But what about the second application, which is equivalent to i squared a? Well, a second application would mean another rotation by 90 degrees in the, in the anti-clockwise sense. So then you get a vector lying completely on the negative real axis at a distance of a units from the origin. So this means that i squared a equals negative a, which gives us the equivalence of i squared being negative 1, which is a pretty cool way of visualizing what exactly the imaginary unit does. 
And although I used a real number to demonstrate how I rotate vectors in the complex plane, such rotation can be demonstrated using any arbitrary complex number z, as in if you multiply i with z, you'll end up rotating z 90 degrees in the anti-clockwise sense about the origin, using complex number multiplication that will demonstrate later on in the video. But first we need to talk about addition of complex numbers. So again, building on that whole complex numbers as vectors thing, we know that vectors are added component wise. So that means if I take a complex number z sub one as x sub one times i times y sub one and z sub two as x sub two plus i y sub two, adding these two complex numbers means I'm just adding together their real and imaginary parts. So I have x sub one plus x sub two plus i times, oh, terribly, sorry about that, y sub one plus y sub two. Another operation on vectors is scalar multiplication, meaning that if you take a real number, c, and if you multiply it by the vector z, then this is equivalent to just multiplying c with the components. So you have c times x plus i times y, so we have this multiplication of the real number just distributed over the real and imaginary parts. So we have c times x plus i times c y. And of course, by picking a very special real number that is taking c to be negative one, we can define the negative of z as being negative x minus i times y. So for every complex number z, we have its additive inverse negative z, where z plus negative z equals zero. Another cool thing about complex numbers is the existence of complex conjugates. And what exactly is a complex conjugate? Well, given any vector z equal to x plus i times y, if you reflect this vector in the real axis, what you get is z bar, called the complex conjugate of z. And this would be x minus i times y. So this means that given any complex number z, complex conjugation just means we have to reverse the sign for the imaginary part. So we have x minus i times y. And this of course implies that z bar bar would be just z again. And it's obvious that z and z bar both have the same moduli because, well, they're vectors of the same length. And if I take these two equations, that is z equal to x plus i times y, and z bar equal to x minus i times y, and if I solve them for x and y, this gives me x equal to z plus z bar divided by two, and i times y, equal to z minus z bar divided by two. So here I've expressed the real and imaginary parts of a complex number z in terms of the complex number z and its complex conjugate. In other words, I'm expressing x and y as functions of z and z bar. And these equations actually give, a, give an interesting interpretation of how the complex plane is constructed. Given any vector z and its conjugate z bar, the real axis would be that straight line that bisects the angle between them. And the imaginary axis is the line perpendicular to the real axis. So that is pretty cool. That is pretty cool indeed. And what about representing the modulus or the squared modulus of z in terms of its conjugate? Well, we know that this here would be equal to x squared plus y squared, and this means that we have x squared minus i squared y squared. So this can be factorized, this expression can be factorized in the complex realm as x minus i times y, and x plus i times y. And what this means is that z modulus squared equals z times z bar. Okay, that is pretty damn cool indeed. Now, how exactly does complex number multiplication fit into the vector framework that we're using? Well, this is where it gets really interesting. If you take a couple of complex numbers, u and v, and we know how to multiply two complex numbers, right? We learned that in high school. But in this case, consider u times the conjugate of v. 
So if I write u as a plus i times b, and if I write v as c plus i times d, then I can write u times the conjugate of v as a plus i times b times c minus i times d. And we know how to multiply them, right? We just have to distribute the multiplication over the addition. So we have a c minus i times a d plus i times b c minus i squared b d. And i squared is just negative one. So we have a positive b d over there. So that means we have a c plus b d minus i times a d minus b c. So that's u times the conjugate of v. Now, where do the vectors come into play? Well, let's consider u and v now as vectors. So if you write u as a x cap plus b y cap, and if you write v as c x cap plus d y cap, then we see here that the AC plus BD term is just U dot V, correct? And the AD minus BD term, this here is the magnitude of U cross V. So this implies that U times the conjugate of V equals U dot V minus I times the magnitude of U cross V, as in the real part of U times v bar equals the dot product and the imaginary part of u times v bar equals the negative of the magnitude of the cross product of u and v. And that is pretty damn cool. Finally, we have property 7 that talks about the existence of multiplicative inverses for complex numbers. So for any non-zero z, we can define z inverse as one by z, and this of course would be one by x plus i times y. And we can separate one by z into real and imaginary parts by expanding using the conjugate. So I have x minus i times y upstairs and x minus i times y downstairs. So this simplifies to x minus i y divided by z times z conjugate is the squared modulus of z. So all of this implies that the real part of 1 by z is in fact the real part of z divided by the modulus of z squared, and the imaginary part of 1 by z is in fact the negative of the imaginary part divided by the squared absolute value of z. And that's pretty much a wrap for this video. Check out the link in the description for a write-up on the properties of the modulus operator, and that write-up also contains some homework problems for you. We're going to be using mostly Gamelin's text for problems and as a reference book. So I hope you enjoyed the video. I hope you learned something. Thank you. See you next time.